June 5th, 2004. Um, this is Jenny Conyers Veda interviewing Private First Class James W. Conyers of Hamilton, Ohio. Um, Private Conyers was part of the U.S. Army during World War II. Um, during the Army, or during the um, years right before the war, uh, what were you doing, Private yeah, Conyers? In high school. Okay. And when war was declared, um, what were you doing? We were still in high school. You were in high school. And at what point during high school were you drafted? After my 18th birthday. Okay. And so you were a junior? Uh, that'd be all right. Right. Okay. And so you didn't get to finish your junior year of school? No, you... we were taken out of, out of the school to, and go right to the Army. Okay. And you and you have an, had a twin brother. Right. So you and your brother were both drafted at the same time? Right. Right, and so together you were inducted on the same day at the right. same time. And where did you go? Fort Thomas, Kentucky, to, to uh, be processed and, with uniforms and go to Camp Miles Standish. And, no, <laughs> we went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, right. okay, for basic training and field artillery. How did you and your brother end up being in the army? You wanted to, didn't you want to be in the Marines? Yeah. And you well, I uh, went to the induction center. They were, uh, well, getting all goofed up here. That's okay. Go on. So you well, wanted I went to camp, uh, what's that, how were you? You were to, to the induction camp to be processed for the branch of the service. I uh, only I couldn't be in the Marines. Because you were colorblind, yeah. right? And I said, well, uh, I don't want the Navy, so the Army will have to be it. Right. And was that the same case for your twin brother? Was he also colorblind? I don't know. Oh, okay. I didn't hear that part. Okay. So you both were inducted into the Army? Right. In um, Kentucky, Fort Thomas? Fort Thomas, Kentucky. And then you went to... Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay. And you were both, you both went into the artillery? Yeah. Okay. And trained for um, artillery. So then when, um, you were telling me a story before about getting your picture taken um, for your parents when you were um, in basic training. Mm -hmm. And you were in, at Fort Bragg. Yeah. And you and your brother went into town. Yeah to get your picture taken, yeah. and you were very surprised about the town. <laughs> yes, we were. What surprised you about the town? Well, it's very, very a lot of things, I guess you might say. It's just, uh, we hadn't been away from home, and this is the first time we've been that, that, this far from home. And the people are, I, I don't know whether I should say different or not, but we weren't used to the things that were going on. Okay, so you got your pictures taken, and this was your first leave, and so you had your pictures taken and you went back to base, yeah. and then you didn't take another leave, did you, until? Not until we left. Until you, until you went to get, pick up your pictures until you yeah. left, yeah. So you both had your photos taken and had them sent home, right? Right. Okay, and so when you left there, where did you go? Do you remember? Well, let's see, yeah. We went to from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and we went to Camp Shenango. No, no it's not Camp Shenango. It was a you can look at your notes if you'd like. Camp Miles Standish. Right. In uh, Taunton, Massachusetts. Okay. We stayed up there for, oh, well, I guess two or three months. Mm hmm. And then they decided to ship us out, so we went to New Jersey and got on the Queen Mary and uh, took us four days and 18 hours to get over to Scotland. Okay. So you and your... I'm sorry, go ahead. And that's where we uh, embarked uh, off the Queen Mary to go uh, to a different direction. My brother went one play away, and I went the other. And they went to uh, 
Bristol, England, mm -hmm. until the invasion. So you and your brother had been together uh, through basic training and then on the ride over on the Queen Mary, but then when you got to Scotland, you marched in opposite directions. And then when was the next time you saw him? How many years later? Well, that was um, 40 right after the invasion, a couple of months. So it was a couple of years? Well, two years, was it? Yeah. Two years. If I, uh, I finally uh, found out that he was in the same area where we were based, and I asked the company commander if he, if any way he could find out what, where they were located so I could go see him. And they uh, said they'd see what they could do. So he, uh, the captain uh, sent a jeep over to the billets where I was the next day, and the driver said, we're going to go see your brother, so get your clothes to ready and let's go. And did you find him? Yeah, we found him. And uh, and what was he doing when you found him? <laughs> yeah, him and some of his buddies that were playing cards. So he, you interrupted a card game. Was he surprised to see you? Well, I or did guess he, he was. He didn't, or he didn't, at least he didn't act like it. He just kept on with the card game. Did he know you were coming, or was it a surprise? No, he didn't know I was coming, because I didn't know I was going to get to go. Oh, so that was really pretty cool that they... So that's the first time I saw him after we left uh, Scotland. Oh, okay. Continuing on, let's talk a little bit about your um, experiences in Europe. You told us that you had gotten off the Queen Mary and you were in um, Scotland. And from Scotland then you went to England, correct? Um, Bristol, England. Right. You'd originally been trained in artillery, but at some point uh, from between the United States and England, the decision was made that you were going to become a military policeman, right? Right. So in... England, you were part of it, the MP group. Right. Wh which group were you part of? 509th Military Police. And what were your assignments? What did you do in England? Do what they tell us. Which included what? Well, the main thing is we uh, patrolled the area where we were at, and then uh, right before we went left for the invasion, there was a trucking company and uh, a problem with their personnel, and uh, they told us that we were going on a trip. So we had four, four by eight trucks with a canvas over the top, and five jeeps, and uh, we took off. And when we took off, we went to this trucking company where they were having the trouble, and these. Uh, People there, when we pulled in, didn't know what was going on, but they told, uh, they had the fellows who were, well, I guess you would say, mutiny. They didn't, they were not going anywhere, and they weren't going to, in the invasion, so they, uh, what they did, they filed charges on them, and then we took them to a stockade. And at the stockade, they thought we were coming down there to get some of those people and take them someplace else. But we were just took more for them. Oh. So that's where those gentlemen uh, spent the war, I guess, in that stockade until they sent them back home mm -hmm. with a dishonorable discharge, probably. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is the 60th anniversary of the invasion. Do you remember what you were doing the day before the invasion 60 years ago? I was in school. No, before the invasion. Oh, the day before the invasion. There. Yes. The day before. The day before? Mm -hmm. Well, they took our unit and, and took us down to direct traffic and for the personnel to get on the boats to go to France. So you all knew something big was happening. Yeah. Well, when they got on the boats, we knew what something happened. Right. But, uh, so you helped load boats? We were directing traffic and, and mm -hmm. 
and directed the uh, traffic to the ships that these people were getting on to go to France. Mm -hmm. And then after we got done loading these gentlemen up, our captain told us, I said, well, grab your, grab your duffel bag, boys, you're going, you're the next one's on. So we got on and went to France. And so you, you crossed the English Channel in one of those, um, what are they called, Hummel, huddle crafts? What were those? Well, it was the in landing barges. Oh, landing barges, okay. And we got over there to go with them to France. The Navy man who was running our landing barge took us in, and he was supposed to take us into as close to the shore as we could get. And instead, he dropped the gate for everybody to unload uh, out in about neck high water. Oh my! And we walking in with our equipment and and wet uniforms, and that's the way we were for about three days. Oh. Before we could change. So wet and smelly from the English Channel. Well, I guess you might say so. But alive. Yeah. That's the important thing. Why don't you hold up the picture that you brought? of um, you at, in your, with your military uh, police uh, whistle on your shoulder, epaulette. And we'll hold that for a minute and get a close-up. And that picture was taken when? 1944, I think. Yeah, I think so. Okay. We got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. You can put it down. Good. Um, so... Once you were in Normandy, then you spent the remainder of the war in the European theater, right? Right. Part of the First Army? Yeah. And you had been in the 509th Military Police. Yeah. But once you got to... When we got in France, the, uh, they changed the number to the 713th Combat okay. Military Police. Okay. And the group that you were with, the platoon you were with, was a um, replacement unit, correct? Yeah. From most of the GIs were from New York and New Jersey, right? Yeah. And many of them were substantially older than you. Yeah, I would say so. You were how old? Eighteen. Mm -hmm. And most of the uh, replacement unit were had been reservists, correct? Yeah. So uh, you were one of the younger guys in the unit. That's right. Right, and. Most of them served as older brothers to you. Okay. Um, why don't you show us, you also brought a map of the First Army. Why don't you hold that up and we'll talk a little bit about this map shows the entire trip and we'll pick it up. You can see that you were in Scotland and then you went to Britain and then you hit Normandy. And then from Normandy, where did you go? Do you recall? Well, we were in France for a while. Mm -hmm. And after we got the finito, we were able to move. We moved into Belgium, the Battle of the Bulge. And, uh, Tell me about your, and your memories of the Battle of the Bulge. It was cold, snowy, mm -hmm. and a lot of fighting going on. Mm -hmm. so then, did you sleep um, at all during the battle? Some, and did whenever they, you could. Do you want to put your map down now? That'll, we've got that. Good, thank you. And um, so there was a lot of snow. How deep was the snow? Well, some place it was, I guess, four inches to six inches on the ground. Mm -hmm. And were you marching or were you riding in a Jeep or on a truck or? Well, we were in uh, vehicles. Jeeps. Mm -hmm. So uh, didn't use motorcycles because the stoves too much. Right. Most of our was jeeps and half tracks. Oh, okay. And a half track is what? Well, a half track is a half car and a half truck. Oh. And one of them's got uh, what do you call a? Their tire. The front end has tires, right? Yeah. That's it. And then the other had tracks on them in the back. Oh, okay. And it was with, they had a 50 caliber machine gun on it, and then we had a 45 in a vehicle and rifles. Mm -hmm. so. And then after the Battle of the Bulge, where did you go? 
Well, we kept going toward Belgium. Oh, okay. So you were headed to Belgium. Yeah. Okay. So you went through France into Belgium, and then where did the First Army go after that? We went into Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you ended up in Germany when the fighting stopped? Was when that where you were? Was, when, when the war, the war ended, you were, in, you were in Germany? Yeah. Okay. And then they kept us there for about six months, the occupation of Berlin, Germany. Right. So when the, the war ended um, and, and peace was proclaimed, you didn't get to go home right away? No. No. You were part of a, a, a um, detachment. Occupational force. Right. You were part of an occupational force and um, that was called what? What was the name of the group you, were, you belonged to? The Big Sixty? Oh, yeah. Um, and the Special Platoon. And they, all the men in the Big Sixty was uh, six foot or about taller. Mm -hmm. And then we started using, uh, at the Potsdam Conference, we had uh, guarded the Secretary of State, Stimson, and uh, the other countries, France and, and England, and their dignitaries were in the same area and they had their MPs like the garden, their, their, their residents. Oh, okay. I'm going to pause. All right, we'll keep going. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, life in the Army. Um, how did you stay in touch with your family? Letters. And packages? Well, some. Mm -hmm. did, how often did they have mail call? Every day. So GIs were able to get their mail. If okay. you had any. Right. And you had some folks at home who were writing to you. Who were? Who did you get mail from? I got mail from one of my aunts and uh, a couple of people from up church where I was going. Mm -hmm. They uh, would write. I'd answer them back. Mm -hmm. What about the food? What was the food like in the army? Well, some of it was all right, and some of it wasn't so hot, especially the K rations. Mm -hmm. In uh, basic, though, there was lots of food, wasn't there? Oh yeah, yeah. You got to eat a lot. They fatten you up. Uh huh. And then they, when you got to Europe, there wasn't quite as much food, right? Well. We did all right when we were in England, uh -huh. but the things uh, changed when you landed in Normandy. Right. So. Right. And so you ate a lot of K rations. What are K rations? Well, it was a box lunch, you might say, that they packed. Mm -hmm. And then when you didn't have the mess hall around you, that's what you got to eat. So it was cold, cold food? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what usually was in it? Well, it seemed like uh, all they ever had in the ones that I ever got was cheese. Cheese. <laughs> Which is why you love cheese. Yeah, boy, I did. You had to learn to love it, huh? Yeah. When you were in Europe, I don't imagine you got very much leave, but um, did you ever get to go on leave? In Europe? Mm-hmm. Not until after the war. Not until after the war, so there really wasn't. So what did you uh, and your uh, members of your platoon do um, to pass the time when you weren't on duty or when there wasn't any kind of combat? Probably we were resting. Resting, yeah. Sleeping a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything in particular that you remember that you guys did together for, uh, to pass the time? Nothing not particularly we, I, we did. I didn't play cards, so I... Mm -hmm. Kind of missed out on that. I know a lot of people kept um, personal diaries, and you brought one, too. You want to just hold it up a little bit so we can see? That looks like something you would have kept in your pants pocket or jacket or shirt pocket. Shirt pocket. And what kinds of things did you write in your... Well, uh, I wrote in there was, uh, different cities we went to right. and, and the countries. So you pretty much kept a chronicle of your itinerary. Yeah. So you can tell us on uh, when you moved from one location to another, right? right? Okay. 
Um, we were talking earlier before we turned on the tape, and you told me a humorous story about um, running into um, General Eisenhower. Do you want to tell us that, tell that story again? Well, I guess I could. I uh, I was pulling night duty, and Eisenhower and his staff was up there, and uh, they come out talking and this and that, and they had flashlight uh, so they could see, and uh, they kept coming toward me, and I hollered at them. I said, "Turn that light out," and they guy walked up and he said, you know who you're talking to? I said, no, I don't. I just said, turn the light out. The light was supposed to be off, not on. And Eisenhower walked up and he, and this guy, the colonel said, now this is General Eisenhower. I said, that's all right. I want to get home after this thing is over with. And Eisenhower said, he does too. And that was the conversation. So did he turn off his light? Yes, he did. Oh, good. So he followed orders of the MP. That Everybody is, else has to do that. He, he, they did that too. Okay. You mentioned earlier about um, when you were in Germany. You were in Germany when the war ended, and um, you were not one of the soldiers who got to go home right away. You were part of the Big Sixty and stayed for the peace conference, the Potsdam Conference. What did you do uh, for the six months after the war was over? That you well, we went to Berlin and, and, and the occupation of forces in mm -hmm. until we were relieved by the 101st Airborne. So you were part. You did part of the police duty for yeah, the Potsdam we Conference. Yeah. And what what did you do mostly? Ride around, and see there's no trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. When you were finally discharged, it was six months after the war in Europe had ended, right? right? Well, let's see, I, six months. Uh, we stayed, stayed in Berlin for the occupation, and we were there about six months. And then after that, they, when we were relieved, then we came home. Mm -hmm. Actually, we were headed for Japan. And instead of going to Japan, the war was over. Uh, over with Japan, the time that we were on the Thomas H. Berry cattle boat going uh, going home, and then they just transferred us from going to, to the Japan to the United States. Oh, so you went over to Europe on the Queen Mary, yeah. and you came back on a cattle boat. That's right. Wow, like a cattle boat, I'll tell you. Really? So when you arrived back in New York. Um, it was long after all of the parades and after all of the um, celebrating that the war was over. People had pretty much gotten back to um, normal living. What did you do when you got off the boat in New York City? Well, we got off the boat and they put a, and then we got on a train and went to Camp Shenango, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. But before, when you were in New York City, and you were back in the city and you were able to have your first meal. What did you have to eat in New York City? Well, I don't I really know what I had in New York City, but... Uh, Didn't you have a steak dinner? Well, that was in uh, Camp Shenango. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So in Camp Shenango, when you got there, you had your steak dinner, right? I had my steak dinner. I had two steaks and I had about a half a gallon of ice cream. Of ice too. cream. And that's a story that you've told in your family for many years. And in fact, didn't your family have a welcome home celebration party for you yeah. 45 years late? Yeah, I got one though. Right. Your daughters took care of that. And you all ate steak right. and ice cream, right? Right. right, I had steak and ice cream. Right. So you were in Camp Shenango, and where did you go from there? Coming home. Well, we were then in town Gap, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. to uh, get a train and, and, and process to and getting out of the Army. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we took the train from Indentown Gap, Pennsylvania, and we were going west, and they got went to uh, Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And they got in Dayton, and we had, had to wait for the train coming south and uh, 
finally they showed up and we got on that train. And the uh, conductor was walking through and asking about where some of the falls were from. And I told him, I said, for me, when you hit Hamilton a high, if I'm sleeping, roll me and my bag and me off right there. He said, I'll take good care of that because I'm from Hamilton myself. I said, well, good. So a couple of years later, I started working for the railroad, the B&O, and this conductor I saw quite often after that. And he lived in Hamilton, too. So that's about the extent of that. So it turned out that the man who got you off the train in Hamilton turned out to be somebody that you worked with later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when you got home, um, what did you do? With, what's the first thing you did when you got home? Well, when I got home, my only lived right. Uh, my dad bought a house right around around the corner from the railroad station. So I walked over there and, and went in and dropped my duffel bag on the porch and then went in, and went in. And I asked my stepmother, I said, which bedroom am I supposed to be sleeping in? And she said, why? I said, that's where I'm going now. So I went to bed. And that was about 8, 9, maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. and Dad and my brother were both working. So your brother had already come home from oh, the... Yeah. from the came home before I did. Right. Okay. So then, after you get home, and you had a nice sleep, then... You, um, what did you do? Did you go back to school or did you get a job? What did you do? Well, I got a job. And then after a couple months of working, uh, my brother and I both went back to high school to finish up and got our diplomas. And, and you were telling me about how you got your first job when you got home. Well, I got my first job when I came back. I went to see some school teachers that I had when I was in, going to high school. And I went and saw one man, and uh, I was talking to him and this and that, and he asked me if I was working, and I said, not yet, but I'm going to start looking for a job tomorrow. So he said, well, you wait a minute. And he sat down and wrote a, a note to a friend of his that wore a, worked over at the Champion Paper Company in Hamilton and he told me who to give it to and I did and uh, when the man read the note he told the secretary to take an application for this man to go to work so that's where I started. So that's how you got your job? Okay. Um, I wanted to talk just a, a little bit more about after coming home and I was interested in knowing whether or not you had joined any veterans organizations. I belong to the American Legion and the VFW. Okay. And you're a lifelong member of VFW. A lifelong member of VFW. Okay. And I know that you were really very anxious to um, see the World War II Memorial in Washington be built and that you, in fact, were active in um, fundraising in the Hamilton, Fairfield, Ohio area. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, they said they were going to finally build it after 60 years. And I thought it should have been done before this. So I uh, decided, well, I'll help them get started. So I was pretty active in bowling here in, where I live. So I uh, contacted the proprietors of the three bowling establishments to see if I could do, uh, come in and campaign for donations for the memorial. And all three of them gave me the permission. So in the evenings, I get my can of that fixed up and I'd go down to one bowling alley and, and uh, take collections there from the people and they were pretty generous about it. And then if I had another big leg going on, I'd go back to the next line and get that. And I did that in all three of the bowling establishments and we collected, I collected around a thousand bucks to send to them. Um, that's the only that's the only thing mm -hmm. I can say about that. And so you're going to be traveling to Washington D.C. this summer to see the memorial, right? Right. And our two daughters, and a granddaughter, a son-in-law, and mother and me are 
going to head for Washington for two or three days, and so we can see the what the donations brought. Is there anything else that you'd like to um, talk about on this tape before we end? Well, I guess I'm one of few people that can wear their World War II uniform yet that uh, that I have. So it still fits. It still fits. And did you not wear it recently? Yeah, they had a gathering at Hamilton for uh, the veterans, and uh, I guess there was a couple hundred people there, and I was the only one that was wearing my uniform. And then a lot of people didn't believe that that was mine. But it still fits? Oh, yes, it does. That's pretty impressive. Well, we want to thank you, Private Conyers, for sharing your recollections of the war with us. Um, congratulations for being part of the greatest generation and thank you for your contributions.